cool. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I've been loving your tweets. I've been loving getting to know you in the, the digital format. I'm really excited to have a, a conversation with you. Yeah, excited to be here, man. Thanks. Likewise. Um, so I got to do this. And I was thinking to myself, am I really going to open the podcast with such a lame fucking question? But Barack Obama follows you on Twitter. And like, <laughs> what was that moment like when basically the most famous person in the world followed you on Twitter? Like, I, I guarantee you remember that moment. I, I got to know. I do. I do remember that moment, but it's not what you, it, it's not a moment that you would think. It's not like I met Barack and then he followed me or anything like that. I think it was just like during the heat of one of his campaigns, uh, I followed him because I wanted to find out more information about what's going on and he was following people back. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm just one of those lucky few that is like followed by Barack like indefinitely. Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty Yeah. Nice. All right. I get it. But at least it's still like a little pin you can like carry totally. on with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's so funny because like, you know, I don't have a huge online presence. That's not been my story. I haven't been out there trying to be an influencer or doing, you know, that sort of route. But, um, you, you know, when you get followed by somebody like, like I just got followed by Paris Hilton the other day because of the NFT space. <laughs> yeah. And it, that was just such a, like a trip because you're like, okay like you, you know what i mean i mean i know it's like her social media manager or whatever that was like let me just follow people in the nft space but yeah. it's still pretty fun yeah that is hysterical um cool i just i had to know i don't know All why right. i went from barack to paris though like that well, is no. such the <laughs> I, i'm so glad that you did because i was even talking to my wife about it i was like am i really gonna come out with this lame like gimmicky question and then in my head i was playing the joke i was like and then i saw you got followed by paris hilton and i was like oh <laughs> damn he's <Yeah>. real <laughs> big time <laughs> just had to, you just gotta go with it uh, um all right so i start basically every conversation out with uh with the same question the background picture on your Twitter, I realized that you actually just changed it. Um, and it, I find it to be a really great conversation starter. So tell me about that picture and tell me what it means to you. Yeah, well, that's funny. So the, I'll tell you what the, the one that I changed it from was because I yeah, think I um, that evolution is kind of, kind of interesting. So the, what I had up for a little while was this shot that I took from a family trip up the coast. We went up to Oregon and then we came down, you know, the Northern California coast. And when we were doing that, we uh, stopped in this place called um, Elk Prairie. And it was this campground right at the base of the Redwoods. And I woke up one morning and there was like this just epic clearing of these massive Redwoods. And then this little car was driving by and you realize like, dude, these things are like 30 stories tall, right? Like you just put it in perspective. And it, it was such a magical moment. I just happened to have my camera or my phone and I was able to grab a shot. And that whole trip, I was taking these photos that were like, you know, really sort of impactful, big nature, like, you know, I'm a small human, look how big the world is mm -hmm. moments. And what happened is it really connected me to my creativity through photography in a way that like, I kind of hadn't put together up till that point. I've always taken photos on all my trips but all of a sudden it was like, oh wow, like I'm actually like, this is a way for me to express myself creatively that, you know, that I hadn't had for a while, for a while. So that was up. And if, and my website actually uses a bunch of that imagery, I kind of like branded everything with that. Um, and then the NFT thing kind of popped off. And that was the first photo that I minted as an NFT and it sold immediately. And so, that has an interesting story. But then as I started getting into the NFT space, I started to go back into like my design roots and, and kind of start creating new stuff. And so what's up there now, what it's been replaced by was this triptych series that I created specifically for digital art that used some old photography, but layered on new um, design assets. So in a way it's like an evolution for me of Kind of where i've been with the old photography and where i'm going with you know new creative output that's so cool um a couple of things i want to comment i i went to the redwoods with my wife just this past year and i know exactly what you mean you see pictures of it but it's still kind of it's difficult to explain it like you, you i guess yeah. you gotta see it all of a sudden you're in this forest and you feel like some giant like pterodactyl 
It's just yeah. gonna come down and like yeah. wipe you up. You feel so tiny. Um, so a comment on that, but but yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I did as much research on on your art as I could for this conversation. But in your new picture with the triptych series, I think you called it. In, in the background of the picture, some of your old photography is like embedded in there, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny. Like my my story my creative journey, if you will, you mm. know, comes from like really kind of establishing myself as a designer who was doing a lot of commercial work within music. So album packaging, posters, whatever. And it was a lot of layering stuff. And it was a lot of like that kind of, uh, you know, really graphic design based output. And then it went, my career shifted a lot. It went from that to like writing code and doing stuff digitally and then it went to music videos and creating, you know, content that way. Then it went into VR and XR and has continued to sort of follow like more emerging technology trends. Mm -hmm. But throughout all of that, I would have never once called myself a photographer. But throughout all of that, when I look back in my, you know, photos, like my app, there are so many photos I've taken, whether it be like in Thailand or in Beijing or, you know, wherever I was going to like shoot stuff and, and take meetings and whatnot. And, and like, I'm a creative. And I look back at that stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I have a creative eye and it shows up in my photography in a way that I could have, I, they were just my personal photos. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden I've released, when I started to release them publicly, like let people see them, and I started to get these comments from other photographers who are like, like professional photographers, because I don't consider myself one. They're like, dude, you're a photographer. And I was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, no, you are. Like, and it took me a few weeks to like be like, no, that's okay. I'm a photographer. I'm also these other things too. And so those photos that are in those pieces, like they are like the Flatiron Building, right? And they're the, the towers in Chicago. Um, those brutalist towers and then it's a roadway um, out in the desert and these are things that like just really remind me of where I've been yeah. and then all that layering on top is really this thing of like okay let's like flip that and let's make it something new sure. so because that's where I'm at in, in career and stuff right now like everything that's going on with technology and art is all like flipping and it's fascinating fascinating it is and <laughs> we're going to get there. I'm dying to talk about this NFT space, but uh, you're, you're just saying things that are relating to me so much. For instance, when you said like, I'm a photographer, I, I got my career as a writer, but it wasn't until maybe three years ago that I actually started saying like, I'm a writer. And we'd be like, Oh, what do you do? It was like, Oh, I, I, I write blog posts on this website that, that I created or like I built yeah. this, this, this community um, by writing blog posts. And I know like we're just talking about semantics really, but something happens when, um, when you just start actually identifying yourself as a professional, right? Because it's not just a thing that I do, it's a thing that I am. And, and so when you say it that way, I, I know the people listening to this, and you've actually been pretty open about this kind of stuff, even just on Twitter about like, holy shit, like I'm sharing my art out there, like I'm putting myself out there, being vulnerable, you know, like we all feel that. Um, and then it's just, it's just that switch where you say like, no, this isn't just a thing I do. This is a thing that I am. And I think that's really yeah. cool. Well, it's, it's funny because, um, I mean, you just hit on one, you know, sort of big point for me is like, and I talked to all of the young creatives that I mentor about this too. Vulnerability in what we do is so important because if you're not being vulnerable and showing your sort of true self through whatever your artistic expression is, then you're not going to connect with through that expression, right? And that might be your words, it might be your art, it might be whatever. And for me, I had a really hard time being vulnerable and expressing my creativity, like mine, right? Mm -hmm. I could do it for you. Yeah. And I could do it for a client and I could like put it all out there on that project. But when it came to releasing like stuff that was connected to me, I hadn't, I have never done that. You know, I have a 20 year art career, creative career that has never once, you know, been personal work out in galleries or in a space or anything. Wow. So when it came to, I mean, re really just a few months ago, stepping out and being like, I'm going to, I'm going to be as vulnerable as I could possibly be and put this thing out there in the world for people to judge 
or buy or praise or you know tear down whatever it on <laughs> yeah. yeah like it's that moment of just like i'm gonna lob it over the wall and then just fucking hide you know because it was really scary and but through that fear and through that vulnerability what's happened is you know my community of artists and my network has grown exponentially in the past few months in a way that like i is completely foreign to me completely unimaginable to me like i'm like connected and friends with artists that i'm like dude you are fucking incredible mm. and i would have i would have only ever like seen your work and been like that's dope but now we're having conversations about life and collaboration just because i was vulnerable enough to be like here i am yep. you know so i don't know that that vulnerability and that that like um that push into that space is done and this is why I, I, I can tell it to a young creative. I can be like, you need to do this, but I couldn't do it for myself, mm -hmm. right? Because as they're trying to figure out how to network and trying to build, build their professional career, I would always give them that advice. But now I'm taking it instead, you know, and it's actually like, it's so, it, my creative life has become so much more fulfilling just in the past couple of months. I love that, man. I love that for a lot of reasons, both like professionally and creatively, but uh, just getting to know you, um, that's like a liberating experience, you know? And so like, I'm almost happy for you in that way that, uh, that you get to go down this new, this new journey. I, I'm not sure if he's your friend or not, um, but I always felt that way about Bobby Hundreds, where um, when, I, when I talk to my wife, she knows the writers I look up to. And she's like, but I don't get it. He's got a streetwear brand. I was like, no, but you don't understand. He was like, he really revolutionized this idea of creating a brand through just honest, raw, authentic, creative writing. And uh, yeah. he was always on just like my pedestal of like people that I want to um, emulate in a way. I, it's so funny, Bobby, um, we have been in similar orbits since they started the hundreds, you know, and we've connected here and there over the years. And um, I did a streetwear or a uh, footwear line with Dave Grohl called Hooves, which was like a black metal um, Nike Air Jordan. If you like, that was the best, that's the best way to describe it. And I remember when we did that line, we took it over to Bobby and he featured it on the blog, yeah. you know? And so we've always been connected in some way, but what's happened recently is we're both part of a, this like um, friends with benefits uh, yeah. thing, you know, at this Dow. And then we're both connected to Mike Shinoda in a couple different ways. And we both sort of realized like, dude, why are we not hanging out? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we not, why have we never actually like put it together, like get our families together and like do stuff. And so that's kind of the next step with Bobby. It's so funny. Like we we're developing a friendship digitally, you know, over Twitter and over some other, you know, mediums um, that is turning into a, a more true friendship, which is weird for me. I've, I've had a hard time making like, you know, I know this is more of like a professional blog, but like this, this really relates. I've had a hard time forming bonds with people my entire life. I can do it. Like I can walk into a room and we can talk creative and we can talk like a project yeah. all day long. But as soon as you take it out of there, like it's just been awkward for me. And so that's one thing that's really interesting with the vulnerability has, has come this idea that like, oh, wow, the network is expanding like personally and professionally. It's cool. And I'm like yeah. 40, just figuring this out. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, fuck. Yeah, that's amazing. That's actually why I uh, started my podcast for that reason. I had a speech impediment growing up and it just got to the point where I moved to Nashville because I lived in Florida and, you know, I got sober with all of those guys. So you have like a yeah. bond, right? And uh, they're just kind of like automatic friends. And then all of a sudden I'm here and I don't know anybody. And I always struggle with like talking to people. Um, and so like through this creative medium of just be willing to like, I've had some really fucking bad podcast episodes, you know, <laughs> and you, you yeah, thought, yeah. Like, oh, like I feel you just got to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you yeah. just publish it. But, um, but all right, man. So let me get into this dude, because this NFT yeah. space is, is very exciting. Um, I'm excited about it for the support of artists. I'm excited about it for like the crazy technological implications that it could have when my brain really goes down the rabbit hole. But um, I want to start with a, a, I guess it's a quote when we first, when I first reached out to you on Twitter and I said, 
hey, it looks like you're into this NFT space. I'd love to talk to you about it. What you said is after years in the digital art world without really a way to monetize outside of brands and commissions, et cetera, this gives us an outlet to do that. So I think we're all pretty familiar with what an NFT is. If not, Google it, figure it out. Yeah. Um, and so why as an artist is this new concept so exciting to you? It's funny, that question changes almost or the answer to that question changes almost week by week right now mm. because the space is evolving so fast and and um how they can be used is evolving and and what people are doing with them is evolving but i think at the at its core what it allows an artist to do what it's what it's allowed me to do and a lot of the people i'm now connected with in this space is is put your work out in a way that bypasses all of the gatekeepers and allows any value applied to that work to be captured by the creator. Those two things, gatekeeperless, you know, distribution of art, and then the ability to capture value directly back is, I mean, that hasn't existed before. Yeah. You've either had to put your work out through like a social media platform and you'll put it out on Instagram and like, you know, you'll get likes for it and you know, whatever, but like they're a gatekeeper and they're collecting all the value out of that you're getting value out of it, building a following and, you know, people might book you for things, but the work itself is not like direct value, but there's more to it than that. Like, I mean, you'll hear a lot of people in the space say, I'm doing it for the art. I'm doing it for the art. And you're like, I mean, come on, really? Like it's a, it's a smart contract that people are buying. And if you're just doing it for the art, then why are you releasing it as an NFT? Yeah. Other than maybe for prov like, you know, for the, the providence of it, the, the ability for it to last like, you know, mm -hmm. forever on the blockchain. But like, come on, right? There's a financial component to all this shit. They, there just is. But at the same time, what's happening is when you, when that takes a secondary seat and it is about art and it is about community, what you realize is that like, now all of a sudden creators are building community with each other and with uh, patrons, you know, collectors of work, co you know, people who love art that is completely separate and completely like creator led. So now like these little pockets of just like art lovers and art makers are sprouting up in a way that feels really revolutionary because it just hasn't existed like this before. Yeah. I think we're all kind of figuring it out as we go along. Uh, you mentioned something though, which I, I think is important to distinguish. I've always been a fan of Seth Godin and his blog, and he wrote a blog uh, basically saying the opposite of, well, I think he's saying that the value in the art we create isn't necessarily in the one-on-one -on -one transaction of it, but rather in the change that the art itself happens within what he would call culture. Um, and so I buy that and I see that and I think to myself, okay, I've written a couple thousand blog posts in my life, right? And I've never sold a blog post, but it creates leverage, so to speak, for you to uh, any number of things, grow a brand, build a following, you know, get appearances, what have you. And so there's people that I think might be worried about the idea of now I'm not creating art for the sake of changing the culture. I'm creating art for the sake of a transaction because now I have like one-on-one -on -one access to, to a, a transaction basically to like a buyer. And you know what? I go back and forth with that, man, because I think to myself, yeah, I see the point, but I also think to myself, how many people have just been making digital art or any kind of art how many people have gotten their gifts stolen from them and other people use their gifts like shithead Steve is an example. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I, I always think of a Shia, uh, Shia, Shia LaBeouf, I call him Shia LaBeouf, but, uh, he was in, uh, this, uh, you know, hot ones that YouTube yeah. show where they eat the hot wings. He was on that. And he said, are memes art? And he said, yes, anything that moves you is art. And that always stuck to me. And I think to myself, well, yeah. it doesn't matter what the medium is if it's moving me. It's yeah. hard. Um, so <laughs> I know that you're expecting a question here. My, my question is basically like, where is this contrast of good and evil, right? Behind creating art to cr move the culture and creating art just to sell it. Well, yeah, I think, I think both things exist, whether or not you're talking about an NFT, mm. right? I think, I think both, like when you talk about a musician, 
like they might get into playing music because they love the art of playing music and they want to, that's how they express themselves as a writer or as a, you know, instrumentalist or whatever. But also in parallel to that, I don't think you're ever going to talk to a musician who's like, yeah, I don't want the record deal and I don't want to go on tour and I don't want the money in the house and the thing like you're get, they're getting into it for both purposes. Yeah. For the most part, otherwise it's just a hobby. Yeah. Right. And so any artist at the same time, like it's about, you know, getting my art out and making my art, not just me, but any artist, but it's also about like building a following or getting it in galleries or, or being able to support yourself off of it so that you can continue to do it or whatever. Some of those people are going to be more altruistic in it. And like, I'm going to use the money I make off of the sales of my art or my music or whatever, in order to continue to spread a good message. And others will be like, no, I'm just out here for the cash grab. And, and there's, I mean, in a lot of ways, unless you're like harming people, like both of those things can kind of, it is what it is. Like it can mm -hmm. kind of coexist. I, I tend to lean to the other side of it, to the altruistic side of it, which is like, let's make art for art's sake, or let's make art to move people, or let's make art that can, you know, elicit change or whatever. I think the NFT space is interesting in, the, in that regard, because people might be out there making that art and they still can, and they still will. But now all of a sudden they can, if a piece of art or a meme or, you know, whatever becomes popular enough or has enough interest around it, they can also now say, instead of just releasing it out into the ether, I can put it on as I can put in, I can attach an NFT to it. And somebody who really values it can now also participate in the ownership of that thing. Mm. And so it can serve a dual purpose. So now I may have gotten, you know, 10 million views on this meme that I created, but now I can also reclaim it and get some value for it in a way that like the social media platforms that are just proliferating it can never give me, right? And again, I'm just using me as like the proverbial me. And I've seen this play out a couple of different ways. Um, Allison, who was uh, Creepy Chan, I don't know if you remember that photo, mm -hmm. um, but if you look up Creepy Chan, she's like this, like it was when she was living in her parents' house and she's like super creepy, like looking at the camera and it became this like, photo that like blew up on 4chan and like, you know, turned into this whole thing. And she ended up posting that. Um, and her whole reason behind it was to reclaim it. And by, by saying, I am the creator of this and putting it on the blockchain. And now someone can purchase that piece of internet history. She, I think she sold it for 60 ETH, which comes out to about $120,000 and completely changed her life. Right. And in a way that like the meme changed her life, she actually built like a career out of that, but now the money actually changes her life too in a different way. And she's sort of paid back for sort of what she was given out into the market. Another one is this, um, this guy, I'm gonna totally butcher his name, but he just did a collaboration with BT. Um, I wanna say it's Sean. But anyway, this guy who did a collaboration with BT around disarming the, um, uh, the bombs and things that are in the ocean out, you know, off the coast of Maui and off the coast of Puerto Rico. Like, apparently we just like, when we're done with munitions, we're like, cool, just dump it in the ocean. And that's a massive ecological disaster. And he's using this piece of art that he created and minted his NFTs and all the funding from that is going into those efforts. And they're actually going to be able to remove some of the ones off the coast of Maui. Wow. And it's also going into PR for that piece. So you know, he's using it as a change, as a change leverage, you know, point of leverage for change. So, you know, I think all these things coexist and, and it's like, um, yeah, there's out, there's people out there chasing the money or chasing the clout or whatever. But I think like, just like in anything, that stuff starts to look pretty transparent, pretty quick. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. And I think it's almost like, as new things emerge, we have no choice other than, how do I say this, almost to respect the intelligence of people to sniff things out. You know what I mean? Like eventually it always just flattens itself out. And that's, that's my viewpoint on it, at least. I think the world's just always going to change. But what, what you talked about with that meme, I think the meme stuff is so interesting because we can laugh about memes all you want, but they have huge cultural significance. Um, they do. In and I, and I, the, the thing that I don't like about some of the conversation I hear around memes is this, is this question about what is art. And you hear it a lot from the fine art community, 
who is bashing NFTs and bashing digital art. And they're like, no, that's not art. Well, why is it not art? Mm -hmm. Because you say it's not art because you didn't put it in your gallery. Well, I would venture to say that it's affected culture in more ways than some of the art that you claim in your gallery, right? I would totally agree. I have had like absolute tear laughter at some of the grumpy cat memes I've seen over the years. And I think to yeah. myself, grumpy cat, and this is just one example, who knows billions and billions of impressions in people's minds. The example I use, I had a, I wrote an article about it, basically what the fuck is, is an NFT on my blog. And uh, one of the examples I use is, you know, that little baby on a beach that's got like his fist pumps, like everybody yeah. knows that baby. And some poor sucker kid out there is probably like 12 years old now. And meanwhile, advertising agencies, gazillions of people got tens of millions of views on social media by basically taking this kid. And he never gave, I guess in a way he gave permission just by uploading it. But there's, there's still like a by proxy of the fact that he didn't realize the cultural significance of that meme. And that meme is hysterical and it's definitely yeah. moved me and it's created a lot of financial impact in the world. So like, why wouldn't that person have the right to say like, no, this is an idea that I put into the, the ecosystem and I need to claim ownership over it. Well, and I think that's like the internet history part of NFTs is really interesting. And I think, you know, foundation is a platform that has really embraced that. And mm -hmm. they started really on the art side and they still do a lot in the art community, but they've really found a niche for like bringing the memes back and like allowing that internet history to be reclaimed. They just sold a, a um, piece, the Edward Stone, Snowden piece, which sold for 5 million. Um, yeah. And then it just got resold for 7 million on the secondary. So when you look at that, like that's massive. Those are like, whether you call them art, whether you call them internet history, whether they're both, you know, like they, they have, massive cultural significance. On the other side of it for digital artists, what I find fascinating is, and I, because I've played in this space for a while and, and a lot of the people that I've sort of come up with have been in this space too. You're talking about people who like are serious professionals at what they do. Like mm -hmm. art that is just absolutely mind blowing. Like when you look at it, you're like, you know, it's just like, Beautiful. right? And where does that art go? Up until this point, where has it gone? right? It's gone on tour with a band and you got paid for a work for hire to put it out that way. Or maybe it made it into a commercial or maybe you made it into a film and it was a work for hire and it went that way. But very few, like almost none um, of those artists were able to like parlay that stuff into a career based on just the art where they retain control and copyright, but they are able to go and show it and sell it in a way um, like a painter does or mm -hmm. like a photographer does because there just hasn't been a place to display it. The fine art community hasn't valued it. There, there's all these reasons. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a way to like, like mark authenticity and distribute and sell that work that is purely digital. It's you know born of the blockchain. It is purely digital. And this art is purely digital. They're like a match made in heaven. Like the, the NFTs are the mechanism to sell that art and capture value in that art. So now you've got guys who, guys and girls who are creating that stuff, selling it, able to make a living. So they no longer have to go out and like do that soul sucking work for the agency. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I've talked to many of them who I'm like, are you doing this? Or are you doing that for this client or this? They're like, no, I don't do that anymore. What I do is I make art and I, and then I put it out as NFTs and people collect it and they're making a living that way. And that's beautiful. Because now all of a sudden, when someone approaches them to do work, it's not, hey, let me do a work for hire with you and I'll pay you pennies on the dollar to, to, to take that and make it mine. It's like, no, 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 there's a 50-50 split here. Yeah. I'm retaining copyright and you can license it from me. Like that's, that's brand new. Yeah, it, it is brand new. And I think it's, it's tough for people to kind of wrap their heads around it. But this example, I don't know why this example popped into my head as to when something is born of the internet, we automatically just, just assume that it's for everybody, right? And so when I was writing that blog, this blog was almost like a research paper for me. We're like, this is going to be big. I need to figure out what's going on here. And so I thought to myself, what's one of the most impactful digital things that's ever created? And for some reason, 
Buzz Lightyear popped into my head. Mm. I think Pixar and animation changed the whole way that we view movies and Toy Story was the first one to do that. So like that first file, imagine being the guy that actually created Buzz Lightyear on Illustrator or something like that. And there's an original AI file of the first sketchings of Buzz Lightyear. And then when you put it like that and you see that, okay, there's a, there's an iconic piece. The example we always use is the Mona Lisa, right? When you say Buzz Lightyear, we all know what you're talking about. And somewhere there was an original AI file of one of the most impactful cinema, uh, impactful graphics made in like cinema history. Well, how the how would that not have value? And now all of a sudden we have a way to say like, no, this is the original. I'm the creator. <laughs> what is it worth to you, <laughs> right? What and and the interesting thing I think about NFTs is like right now it's being applied in that way and providing mm -hmm. value for digital art and you know other things internet history like we talked about but it also has an application that spreads far beyond just art it's authentication of anything right it's like it's weird yeah and it starts to go like really <laughs> really big and mm -hmm. really far reaching because think about it i own a home i have my title I, that title is non-fungible. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sell you a portion of my home, right? Like you, I own the home. And so wouldn't it make sense that that ownership wasn't just like a paper deed that was on file somewhere, like in a filing cabinet and they scanned it? Like, wouldn't it make sense that it was just like an authenticated digital token that showed the transfer of ownership across its life? And you know what I mean? Like, like things like that make... It's going to take a while to get there, yeah. but that's where this goes. And so when people talk about like, oh, NFT is like, you know, this and that's just a fad or whatever, whatever. It's like, well, actually it's not because the, the underlying technology is what's going to power most everything that's transferable, you know, moving forward. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought this up because sometimes I, I, I can see my my family's eyes glaze over when I start to tell them how this works. But this is when it really clicked for me. When I realized that there's going to be stylists that do nothing but claim ownership of clothing launches that they make only for video game avatars. And then right. I start going like, oh my God, that means that there's such thing as virtual real estate. That means that eventually when Which we start having- right now. Yeah. yeah, that it already exists. And then it means, yeah. okay, that means that if a business wants to put like, a virtual reality conference together that somebody's going to buy a token to say like I have ownership over this space so I can set my virtual booth up with my virtual banner to sell my own products and then and then like yeah. you just start going down the rabbit hole um and okay so there's a million places that I can take this but let me let me keep this centered on what we're talking about uh this really has huge impacts on virtual music and uh and who would ever think that we would want to see a virtual concert, but Fortnite is showing that that has obviously got a market for it. And so um, you got a lot of things going on with your life. I'm just going to open this up for you. Virtual music, where do you see it? How is this going to change our culture? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's great. It's a good segue. And um, first, before I do, before I answer that, I'll talk about why I think virtual music the metaverse, virtual goods, whatever you want to call it, is very real. Like a lot of a lot of older people, older generations will see that stuff and go, well, it's virtual, it's not real. But if you talk to my 10 year old um, and you ask her if that, you know, thing that she just bought for Adopt Me and Roblox is real or not, it is as real and even oh, yeah. more so than, you know, the the toy that she has in her toy box. Like they would rather spend their allowance on digital goods that they're buying in game and what's happening right now they're in walled gardens so you're in roblox you buy it in roblox you can't take it out of roblox mm -hmm. you buy a skin in fortnite it's in fortnite you can't take it out of fortnite but the metaverse as we all think about it is really that like open bordered or at least connected walled gardens so now things that i buy can transfer with me and they're in a wallet of some kind and i take them with me just like i take my stuff or my stuff inhabits my house or whatever yeah. so when you talk NFTs, 
what you're talking about is a, me a wallet, a mechanism to move those digital goods around with you that are tied to you. And now all of a sudden they can exist in all these different worlds. So why that matters is um, things like virtual music. So, you know, I've, you sort of alluded to it. I have a big sort of career change that's happened, that's happening right now, where I've been advising a company called uh, Authentic Artists since 2019. And I've just come over to, to lead creative for them. So I'm the executive creative director for Authentic Artists. And what we're doing is creating AI generative virtual artists. So music created by an AI in machine learning that is then tied to a virtual character who you know, becomes an artist, has their own backstory, their own persona, their own look and feel, their own sound. And that music is fully unencumbered by publishing or you know, label rights. There, there are no rights holders. That virtual artist owns their masters, if you will, right? And they're able to create it 24 seven in real time at commercial quality because we're working with, you know, it's a human and machine collaboration. We're working with producers who, you know, do incredible work, like guys like, you know, Young Guru and Mike Shinoda, and they're putting their stamp or they're putting a, a sound on this and then sort of like setting it loose in the world. So these virtual artists can then travel that metaverse we just talked about and can perform in Roblox or can, you know, have an interactive experience on Unreal Engine or over in Unity or on Twitch like we've launched or in real life, right? And, <laughs> and in collaboration with, because we've got video screens everywhere or holograms or AR in yeah. collaboration with physical artists. And it sounds far-fetched if you don't believe in the concept of virtual. But if you believe in the concept of this virtual layer that, that is already over everything that we do, it, it sounds less far-fetched because you're, especially to the kids, like, again, going back to my daughter, when I told her what we're doing and she saw the characters, she's just as invested in those characters as she would be, you know, Billie Eilish, which is her, like, idol, right? And those two things in her mind are one, they're not one in the same, like, obviously she knows one's a human and one's a, a digital creation, but in terms of interest, like, she can be interested in both. They both serve very different purposes. Um, and just exists sort of natively in the world we're building. So you can either embrace that or push against it. And I think there's a rub in there that's happening right now in culture. I think there's a rub, but I think people have already embraced it a lot more than they even realize. Like yeah. Siri is a person and she's right. in all of our lives and nobody questions it. And then I don't think to myself like, oh, I can't remember the last time I tried to say fuck on my phone and it didn't autocorrect a duck and I didn't go fucking Siri and everybody yeah. didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so we, we have already as a culture, whether as individuals or not, have decided that we are okay with these digital um, personalities, personas, whatever you want to call it. I think with that being said though, it is worth doing a double take. When I was looking at the Authentic Artist website, it says interactive virtual artists using deep learning technology. At first I'm like, wait, is that a typo? Didn't they mean interactive virtual art? And I'm like, oh no, they're actually creating artists. And That's right. Yeah, <laughs> and then like, you know, okay. So on one sentence I said, we're all accepting this. We've already accepted it. And then the other side, I'm like, no, you're building artists with their own music that, exist while not also existing. And I think, I think it, <laughs> I don't even like I'm stuck even trying to say what I think about that. It's, it's very, um, it's, it's new and it's going to take some time to get our heads around it. But I think we've already kind of accepted that we're going to allow it. Well, I think the one, so I had this conversation yesterday with um, a, another a brilliant creator that I met in the NFT space. Like I just, keep having these like illuminating, inspiring conversations with people. And we were talking about, um, we're, we're having one of our virtual artists collaborate with a physical artist, a physical um, like, like visual artist who's using AI to generate um, portraitures. So his physical art is actually digital art that's yeah. using AI to generate visuals. And then our virtual artist who's using AI to generate music is gonna collaborate and score that. It's all super meta, right? Like, it, but it's it's her first um, Naomi, one of our artists. It's her first collaboration uh, like that. And what we were talking about 
is this idea that if you look at any future looking publication, book, movie, whatever, um, Ready Player One is the example we were using. Sure. It's always dystopian and it's always like, um, uh, like higher powerless, if you will. It, it, like just to put it in like super like esoteric terms. It's always like AI and technology has turned our environment into this dystopian wasteland where humans have to claw to survive, right? Matrix, like it doesn't matter. Every one of these films is like the same vibe. And I think what a lot of those creators get wrong about where we're going, and this is my view, but it's, it's, I think it's shared by quite a few in the space, is humans inherently um, have a connection to something bigger and have a level of empathy and hu humanity, as we would call it, that um, is always going to shine through. Even if shit gets really dark, even if there's bad people in the world, even if there's wars, even if people use AI for bad instead of good, like all of that stuff, fundamentally humans still exist and we're still here. And that dystopian sort of view is to say that there's like no spirit, no, nothing, nothing bigger that we're tapping into, no spirituality, like no humanity, no empathy, right? Like that is somehow gone. And it's just, it's just frankly not the case. Like look at what we just went through. We all just went through a horrifying pandemic that has completely reshaped how we do business and how we live life and what our priorities are. And what, what's coming out of that is much more connection to each other mm. through isolation, right? Because humans have this like evolutionary spirit of like, I gotta survive, right? Like fundamentally, that's what it, where it comes from. Like if we're going to survive as a species, we have to stick together and we have to grow. So I just, I think a lot of the rub comes from people being scared of technology. Yeah. It, I mean, that's ultimately every time you see pushback against something. I remember it happened in music when, you know, Napster and the MP3 sure. and like everybody pushed back. That's not, ugh, right. And then all of a sudden it upended the music industry mm -hmm. and then streaming. Right. And then, I mean, you name it, you can, you can go down the row TV when, you know, TV came into your home, the film industry was in a panic. Right. And now look at those two coexisting and what's come out of that. NFTs are the same thing. Fine art world is freaking out because they don't get to be the gatekeepers and control it anymore. Um, but in three years, like we won't be calling them NFTs. They'll just be digital art and yeah. everything is just going to have an NFT attached to it. It just is what it is. Yeah. We'll just have screens in our homes. That... So like all this AI talk and all this like stuff about like, you know, like are is it, is our, is it troubling for humanity? Is it going to work? Is it, well, look, I mean, who knows what's going to work? But like the experimentation, the fun with it, the like, you know, having a following the, the trail of, you know, what's happening in culture and what we're reacting to in video games. And it's just like natural. That's just what's coming and, and we'll coexist with it, I think. Uh, I don't, I, I'm hard pressed to find somebody that actually thinks, oh, that'll never happen. Yeah. You know, it's, now. it's just like, of course it's going to. And, you know, man, it is a little bit kind of heady what you were talking about where every time we think about technology it's always some kind of dystopian um yeah like some dry dystopian wasteland where we've all lost our humanity and i i was just thinking about this the other day just with the whole concept of decentralization in general because there's one side that just says like everything needs to be decentralized humans can't trust each other every institution in the world has failed you right and let's say that that takes on which it, it will like middlemen in general and this will take a while but just i mean who knows brokers right like your mortgage broker there's no need for that when you could just right. stamp authentication of something um and so okay like let's just assume that the world will decentralize quote unquote in one way or another but we're still people and no matter what we do this freaking thing inside my head is still a couple hundred thousand years old and it is just going to gravitate towards like i need to do other shit with other people and that's just never ever ever going to change so um so yeah like I, I i am optimistic about it i see this being as some kind of uh <laughs> be careful with the word harmonious right it'll be rough but i'm optimistic that regardless of what technology does to our current standard of living, like we're still gonna do it 
together and keep our humanity in the process. Well, I think that the, the interesting thing about decentralization that I'm starting to wrap my head around is the paradox of it. Like the, de the decentralization that we're talking about causes more connection and mm -hmm. community. Like that's a weird paradox. Like that, it almost feels like it shouldn't be. Like decentralization would mean now we're all our own islands. Yeah. But, but what it's doing, it's actually like fundamentally removing barriers that have blocked people from connecting before, right? And so that's what I see happening. Like right now in a microcosm in the art world, you know, you'll get in a clubhouse room or something and there will be, you know, 50 artists from all walks of life, from all country, people from Turkey and Cuba and, you know, San Francisco and LA and whatever, fine artists, commercial artists, you know, people who just like to doodle, like, you know, and all these different people are now like all of a sudden, they're all rallied around this thing mm -hmm. because all those walls have come down. And so that decentralization acts as a connective tissue in a, in a weird way, right? Like, I don't know, it's, a, it's definitely a paradox because it's not one of those things that like immediately uh, reveals itself. Sure. But then as soon as you're in the middle of it, you realize, oh shit, that's what's happening. Yeah, um, there's, a million analogies that that you can make with that but ultimately i've i've seen that as well where when you remove gatekeepers people just naturally go to the people that they vibe with and now all of those societal gatekeepers are gone basically like eventually the fine artists that are kind of sticking their nose up at you guys are all going to be in the same rooms with you because you're just going to realize that this whole culture that we've invented on what art is 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 gone and so now let's yeah. just talk about cool shit with each other <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and you know people people um have their own opinions on people and his work and mm -hmm. you know and the the price of that big sale and whether it was valid or not and like none of that matters it it's, it, none of it matters if you think banksy is a genius or a crook mm -hmm. it, none of it matters what matters is like these are big cultural moments that are shaping the world and are connecting new sets of people that wouldn't have been connected before. Yeah, man. Um, I totally agree. And I'm excited about it. It's going to be a wild ride for sure. The thing I'm most excited about, and I, you're giving me so much of your time. I don't want to keep you too much longer. And thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time. But the thing that I'm really excited about is right now, when people say NFTs, we think digital art. But that was yeah. just like the first most pragmatic starting point with it. And with all of the ways that this could happen, I'm excited to see what the hell is going to happen, right? Yeah. Like when we created yeah. the internet, we never thought to think of a social timeline until all of a right. sudden we did. And it's like, what is going to be the thing where five years from now, where it's like, oh, like, of course, that's going to be the thing that either a blockchain or an NFT will create. And I'm excited to figure out like what that is. Well, yeah. And I think like, you know, some of the things that people are, are just now starting to wrap their heads around, we've had social tokens for a while, which is like, you know, you buy a set of social tokens and you get access to a community and right. Mm -hmm. But the, the NFT as a, you know, one to one, you know, access point for a community or for an event or, you know, as a way to authenticate, like I am Jeff, right. And I am here in this community or at this event or whatever like that's that's like the next version that we're going to yeah. get to so it moves from art into that right and all of the things that can be done with that around like if i know who all these people are like and it's very clear like you can start to do things with those people that are based on the on their ownership of that one token or that mm -hmm. set of tokens right and when i look at our virtual artists and everything that we're doing like they're born of the internet they're born of the metaverse their whole existence, everything that they do at some point is going to have an NFT attached to it because it's going to be the way that you participate in the fandom yeah. around them, you know, and that's not just for them. They'll probably start it and then physical artists will, you know, pick that up in the right way. But um, yeah, man, it's, it's such an exciting world. Like it's like, it does feel like, and it almost feels like cliche to say this, but it does feel like a Renaissance moment. For sure. It's like a digital technological renaissance moment in the same way that we had the art renaissance or we had, you know, the, um, you know, 
mechanical, you know, the industrial revolution and, you know, it, that's what's happening right now. I, I think that is probably the most apt um, way to describe it. It, it is absolutely going to be something that we look back on 20 years ago and be like, oh, that was the moment where the new way of humanity started. Like Renaissance is the only way that you can explain this. And, and I mean, you know, I have a one month old and sometimes I pick him up and I just stare at him because it's, it's a fucking trip as I'm sure you can say. And I think to myself, like, what, is your world gonna look like? You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> totally, totally. I, I still want my flying skateboard, and you know, like, yeah. and my and like after all, all of this, shit, I still don't yeah. have a flying skateboard. I mean, like, yeah. all right, I got a boosted board, and like, I'm happy to be whipping down the streets with it, but it doesn't fly, and that's the shit I was promised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so funny. Like going back to Bobby Hundreds, like I remember the Hundreds did a promo around, um, you know, shoes. that skateboard. Wow. Yeah, the shoes, and they they did the whole promo where they like brought the board, and it looked like it was legit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there, I just I. Yeah, give me my flying skateboard and we'll be good, you know. <laughs> That's so cool, man. Uh, all right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, the world is open and back up. I got some business partners in LA. Next time I'm, I'm out west, uh, we'll get together. We'll get some coffee. And uh, it was great talking to you. I, I know yeah. that we could sit down and, and shoot the shit for a couple hours on this, but uh, I, I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, and likewise, I, um, I'll be in Nashville soon, actually. So we'll oh, get no way. coffee in Nashville. Yeah, we Perfect. got some friends out there. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. Um, all right, man. All right. So authenticartist.ai, right? That's right. Yeah. Excellent. Authentic. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. I will put <laughs> we it. We do that again. And, um, and uh, I'll put your Twitter on there. And um, all right, man. We'll do this again. Thanks so much, cool. Jeff. Thanks, Tim.